To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Lawyers, I suppose, were children once. Charles Lamb. Part One. Chapter One. When he was nearly thirteen, my brother Jem got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed and Jem's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged, he was seldom self-conscious about his injury. His left arm was somewhat shorter than his right. When he stood or walked, the back of his hand was at right angles to his body, his thumb parallel to his thigh. He couldn't have cared less, so long as he could pass and punt. When enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the events leading to his accident. I maintained that the Yule started it all, but Jem, who was four years my senior, said it started long before that. He said it began the summer Dill came to us, when Dill first gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. I said if he wanted to take a broad view of the thing, it really began with Andrew Jackson. If General Jackson hadn't run the creeks up the creek, Simon Finch would never have paddled up the Alabama, and where would we be if he hadn't? We were far too old to settle an argument with a fist fight, so we consulted Atticus. Our father said we were both right. Being Southerners, it was a source of shame to some members of the family that we had no recorded ancestors on either side of the Battle of Hastings. All we had was Simon Finch, a fur-trapping apothecary from Cornwall, whose piety was exceeded only by his stinginess. In England... Simon was irritated by the persecution of those who called themselves Methodists at the hands of their more liberal brethren, and as Simon called himself a Methodist, he worked his way across the Atlantic to Philadelphia, thence to Jamaica, thence to Mobile, and up the St. Stephens. Mindful of John Wesley's strictures on the use of many words in buying and selling, Simon made a pile practicing medicine, but in this pursuit he was unhappy, lest he be tempted into doing what he knew was not for the glory of God, as in the putting on of gold and costly peril. So Simon, having forgotten his teacher's dictum on the possession of human chattels, bought three slaves, and with their aid established a homestead on the banks of the Alabama River some forty miles above St. Stephen's. He returned to St. Stephen's only once, to find a wife and with her established a line that ran high to daughters. Simon lived to an impressive age and died rich. It was customary for the men in the family to remain on Simon's homestead, Finch's Landing, and make their living from cotton. The place was self-sufficient, modest in comparison with the empires around it. The Landing nevertheless produced everything required to sustain life except ice, wheat flour, and articles of clothing— supplied by riverboats from Mobile. Simon would have regarded with impotent fury the disturbance between the North and the South, as it left his descendants stripped of everything but their land. Yet the tradition of living on the land remained unbroken until well into the twentieth century, when my father, Atticus Finch, went to Montgomery to read law, and his younger brother went to Boston to study medicine. Their sister Alexandra was the Finch who remained at the landing, she married a taciturn man who spent most of his time lying in a hammock by the river, wondering if his trout lines were full. When my father was admitted to the bar, he returned to Maycomb and began his practice. Maycomb, some twenty miles east of Finch's Landing, was the county seat of Maycomb County. Atticus' office in the courthouse contained little more than a hat rack, a spittoon, a checkerboard, and an unsullied code of Alabama. His first two clients were the last two persons hanged in the Macon County Jail. Atticus had urged them to accept the state's generosity in allowing them to plead guilty to second-degree murder and escape with their lives. But they were Haverfords, in Macon County, a name synonymous with jackass. The Haverfords had dispatched Macon's leading blacksmith in a misunderstanding arising from the alleged wrongful detention of a mare, were imprudent enough to do it in the presence of three witnesses, 
and insisted that the son of a bitch at it coming to him was a good enough defense for anybody. They persisted in pleading not guilty to first-degree murder, so there was nothing much Atticus could do for his clients except be present at their departure, an occasion that was probably the beginning of my father's profound distaste for the practice of criminal law. During his first five years in Maka, Mactus practiced economy more than anything. For several years thereafter, he invested his earnings in his brother's education. John Hale Finch was ten years younger than my father, and chose to study medicine at a time when cotton was not worth growing. But after getting Uncle Jack started, Atticus derived a reasonable income from the law. He liked Maycomb. He was Maycomb County born and bred. He knew his people. They knew him. And because of Simon Finch's industry, Atticus was related by blood or marriage to nearly every family in the town. Maycomb was an old town, but it was a tired old town when I first knew it. In rainy weather, the streets turned to red slop. Grass grew on the sidewalks. The courthouse sagged in the square. Somehow it was hotter then. A black dog suffered on a summer's day. Bony mules hitched to hoover carts flicked flies in the sweltering shade of the live oaks on the square. Men's stiff collars wilted by nine in the morning. Ladies bathed before noon after their three o'clock naps, and by nightfall were like soft tea cakes with frostings of sweat and sweet talcum. People moved slowly then. They ambled across the square, shuffled in and out of the stores around it, took their time about everything. A day was twenty-four hours long, but seemed longer. And there was no hurry, for there was nowhere to go, nothing to buy, and no money to buy it with, nothing to see outside the boundaries of Maycomb County. But it was a time of vague optimism for some of the people. Maycomb County had recently been told that it had nothing to fear but fear itself. We lived on the main residential street in town, Atticus, Gemini, plus Calpurnia, our cook. Gemini found our father satisfactory. He played with us, read to us, and treated us with courteous detachment. Calpurnia was something else again. She was all angles and bones. She was nearsighted, she squinted, her hand was wide as a bed slat and twice as hard. She was always ordering me out of the kitchen, asking me why I couldn't behave as well as Jem, when she knew he was older, and calling me home when I wasn't ready to come. Our battles were epic and one-sided. Calpurnia always won, mainly because Atticus always took her side. She had been with us ever since Jem was born, and I had felt her tyrannical presence as long as I could remember. Our mother died when I was two, so I never felt her absence. She was a Graham from Montgomery. Atticus met her when he was first elected to the state legislature. He was middle-aged then. She was fifteen years his junior. Jem was the product of their first year of marriage. Four years later I was born, and two years later our mother died from a sudden heart attack. They said it ran in her family. I did not miss her, but I think Jem did. He remembered her clearly, and sometimes in the middle of a game he would sigh at length, then go off and play by himself behind the car house. When he was like that, I do better than to bother him. When I was almost six and Jem was nearly ten, our summertime boundaries, within calling distance of Calpurnia, were Mrs. Henry Lafayette Dubois' house two doors to the north of us, and the Radley Place three doors to the south. We were never tempted to break them. The Radley Place was inhabited by an unknown entity, the mere description of whom was enough to make us behave for days on end. Mrs. Dubois was plain hell. That was the summer dill came to us. Early one morning, as we were beginning our day's play in the backyard, Jem and I heard something next door in Miss Rachel Haverford's collared patch. We went to the wire fence to see if there was a puppy. Miss Rachel's rat terrier was expecting, 
Instead, we found someone sitting looking at us. Sitting down, he wasn't much higher than the collards. We stared at him until he spoke. Hey. Hey, yourself, said Jem pleasantly. I'm Charles Baker Harris, he said. I can read. So what? I said. I just thought you'd like to know I can read. You got anything needs read and I can do it. How old are you? asked Jem. Four and a half? Going on seven. Shoot, no wonder then, said Jem, jerking his thumb at me. Scout yonder's been reading ever since she was born, and she ain't even started to school yet. You look right puny for going on seven. I'm little, but I'm old, he said. Jem brushed his hair back to get a better look. Why don't you come over, Charles Baker Harris, he said. Lord, what a name. It's not any funnier than yours. Aunt Rachel says your name's Jeremy Atticus Finch. Jem scowled. I'm big enough to fit mine, he said. Your name's longer than you are, but it's a foot longer. Folks call me Dill, said Dill, struggling under the fence. Do better if you go over it instead of under it, I said. Where'd you come from? Dill was from Meridian, Mississippi, was spending the summer with his aunt, Miss Rachel, and would be spending every summer in Macon from now on. His family was from Macon County originally. His mother worked for a photographer in Meridian, had entered his picture at a beautiful child contest, and won five dollars. She gave the money to Dill, who went to the picture show twenty times on it. Don't have any picture shows here, except Jesus ones in the courthouse sometimes, said Jem. Ever see anything good? Dill had seen Dracula, a revelation that moved Jem to eye him with the beginning of respect. Tell it to us, he said. Dill was a curiosity. He wore blue linen shorts that buttoned to his shirt. His hair was snow white and stuck to his head like duck fluff. He was a year my senior, but I towered over him. As he told us the old tale, his blue eyes would lighten and darken. His laugh was sudden and happy. He habitually pulled at a cowlick in the center of his forehead. When Dill reduced Dracula to dust, and Jem said the show sounded better than the book, I asked Dill where his father was. I ain't said anything about him. I haven't got one. Is he dead? No. And if he's not dead, you got one, haven't you? Dill blushed, and Jem told me to hush, a sure sign that Dill had been studied and found acceptable. Thereafter, the summer passed in routine contentment. Routine contentment was improving our treehouse that rested between giant twin chinaberry trees in the backyard, fussing, running through our list of dramas based on the works of Oliver Optic, Victor Appleton, and Edgar Rice Burroughs. In this matter, we were lucky to have Dill. He played the character parts for... formerly thrust upon me, the ape and Tarzan, Mr. Crabtree and the Rover Boys, Mr. Damon and Tom Swift. Thus we came to know Dill as a pocket Merlin, whose head teemed with eccentric plans, strange longings, and quaint fancies. But by the end of August, our repertoire was vapid from countless reproductions, and it was then that Dill gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. The Radley plays fascinated Dill. In spite of our warnings and explanations, it drew him as the moon draws water, but drew him no nearer than the light pole on the corner, a safe distance from the Radley gate. There he would stand, his arm around the fat pole, staring and wondering. The Radley place jutted into a sharp curve beyond our house. Walking south, one faced its porch. The sidewalk turned and ran beside the lot. The house was low, was once white with a deep front porch and green shutters, but had long ago darkened to the color of the slate-gray yard around it. Rain-rotted shingles drooped over the eaves of the veranda. Oak trees kept the sun away. 
The remains of Pickett drunkenly guarded the front yard, a swept yard that was never swept, where Johnson grass and rabbit tobacco grew in abundance. Inside the house lived a malevolent phantom. People said he existed, but Gemini had never seen him. People said he went out at night when the moon was down and peeped in windows. When people's azaleas froze in a cold snap, it was because he had breathed on them. Any stealthy small crimes created a make for his work. Once the town was terrorized by a series of morbid nocturnal events, people's chickens and household pets were found mutilated, although the culprit was Crazy Addy, who eventually drowned himself in Barker's Eddy, People still looked at the Radley place, unwilling to discard their initial suspicions. A negro would not pass the Radley place at night. He would cut across to the sidewalk opposite and whistle as he walked. The Maycomb school grounds adjoined the back of the Radley lot. From the Radley chicken yard, tall pecan trees shook their fruit into the schoolyard. But the nuts lay untouched by the children. Radley pecans would kill you. A baseball hit into the Radley yard was a lost ball, and no questions asked. The misery of that house began many years before Jim and I were born. The Radleys, welcome anywhere in town, kept to themselves a predilection unforgivable in Maycomb. They did not go to church, Maycomb's principal recreation, but worshipped at home. Mrs. Radley seldom, if ever, crossed the street for a mid-morning coffee break with her neighbors, and certainly never joined a missionary circle. Mr. Radley walked to town at eleven-thirty every morning, and came back promptly at twelve, sometimes carrying a brown paper bag that the neighborhood assumed contained the family groceries. I never knew how old Mr. Radley made his living. Jem said he bought cotton, a polite term for doing nothing but Mr. Radley and his wife had lived there with their two sons as long as anybody could remember. The shutters and doors of the Radley house were closed on Sundays, another thing alien to Maycomb's ways. Closed doors meant illness and cold weather only. Of all days, Sunday was the day for formal afternoon visiting. Ladies wore corsets, men wore coats, children wore shoes. But to climb the Radley front steps and call Hey, of a Sunday afternoon, was something their neighbors never did. The Radley house had no screen doors. I once asked Atticus if it had ever had any. Atticus said yes, but before I was born. According to neighborhood legend, when the younger Radley boy was in his teens, he became acquainted with some of the Cunninghams from old Sodom, an enormous and confusing tribe domiciled in the northern part of the county and they formed the nearest thing to a gang ever seen in Maycomb. They did little, but enough to be discussed by the town and publicly warned from three pulpits. They hung around the barber shop. They rode the bus to Abbotsville on Sundays and went to the picture show. They attended dances at the county Riverside Gambling Hall, the Dew Drop Inn, and Fishing Camp. They experimented with stump hole whiskey. Nobody in Maycomb had nerve enough to tell Mr. Radley that his boy was in with the wrong crowd. One, one night, in an excessive spurt of high spirits, the boys backed around the square in a borrowed flivver, resisted arrest by Maycomb's ancient beadle, Mr. Connor, and locked him in the courthouse outhouse. The town decided something had to be done. Mr. Connor said he knew who each and every one of them was, and he was bound to determine they wouldn't get away with it. So the boys came before the probate judge on charges of disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, assault and battery, and using abusive and profane language in the presence and hearing of a female. The judge asked Mr. Connor why he included the last charge. Mr. Connor said they cussed so loud he was sure every lady in Maycomb heard them. The judge decided to send the boys to the state industrial school, where boys were sometimes sent for no other reason than to provide them with food and decent shelter. It was no prison, and it was no disgrace. Mr. Radley thought it was. If the judge released Arthur, Mr. Radley would see to it that Arthur gave no further trouble. Knowing that Mr. Radley's word was his bond, the judge was glad to do so. 
The other boys attended the industrial school and received the best secondary education to be had in the state. One of them eventually worked his way through engineering school at Auburn. The doors of the Radley house were closed on weekdays, as well as Sundays, and Mr. Radley's boy was not seen again for fifteen years. But there came a day, barely within Jem's memory, when Boo Radley was heard from and was seen by several people, but not by Jem. He said Atticus never talked much about the Radleys. When Jem would question him, Atticus' only answer was for him to mind his own business and let the Radleys mind theirs. They had a right to. But when it happened, Jem said Atticus shook his head and said, mm, mm, mm. So Jem received most of his information from Miss Stephanie Crawford, a neighborhood scold who said she knew the whole thing. According to Miss Stephanie, Boo was sitting in the living room, cutting some items from the Maycomb Tribune to paste in his scrapbook. His father entered the room. As Mr. Radley passed by, Boo drove the scissors into his parents' leg, pulled them out, wiped them on his pants, and resumed his activities. Mrs. Radley ran screaming into the street that Arthur was killing them all, but when the sheriff arrived, he found Boo still sitting in the living room, cutting up the Tribune. He was thirty-three years old then. Miss Stephanie said old Mr. Radley said no Radley was going to any asylum when it was suggested that a season in Tuscaloosa might be helpful to Boo. Boo wasn't crazy. He was high-strung at times. It was all right to shut him up, Mr. Radley conceded, but insisted that Boo not be charged with anything. He was not a criminal. The sheriff hadn't the heart to put him in jail alongside Negroes, so Boo was locked in the courthouse basement. Boo's transition from the basement to back home was nebulous in Jim's memory. Miss Stephanie Crawford said some of the town council told Mr. Radley that if he didn't take Boo back, Boo would die of mold from the damp. Besides, Boo could not live forever on the bounty of the county. Nobody knew what form of intimidation Mr. Radley employed to keep Boo out of sight, but Jem figured that Mr. Radley kept him chained to the bed most of the time. Atticus said no, it wasn't that sort of thing, that there were other ways of making people into ghosts. My memory came alive to see Mrs. Radley occasionally open the front door, walk to the edge of the porch, and pour water on her canis. But every day Jem and I would see Mr. Radley walking to and from town. He was a thin, leathery man with colorless eyes, so colorless they did not reflect light. His cheekbones were sharp, and his mouth was wide, with a thin upper lip and a full lower lip. Miss Stephanie Crawford said he was so upright, he took the word of God as his only law, and we believed her, because Mr. Radley's posture was ramrod straight. He never spoke to us. When he passed, we would look at his ground and say, "'Good morning, sir.' and he would cough in reply. Mr. Radley's elder son lived in Pensacola. He came home at Christmas, and he was one of the few persons we ever saw enter or leave the place. From the day Mr. Radley took Arthur home, people said the house died. But there came a day when Atticus told us he'd wear us out if we made any noise in the yard, and commissioned Calpurnia to serve in his absence if she heard a sound out of us. Mr. Radley was dying. He took his time about it. Wooden sawhorses blocked the road at each end of the Radley lot. Straw was put down on the sidewalk. Traffic was diverted to the back street. Dr. Reynolds parked his car in front of our house and walked to the Radleys every time he called. Jem and I crept around the yard for days. At last the sawhorses were taken away and we stood watching for the front porch when Mr. Radley made his final journey past our house. There goes the meanest man ever God blew breath into, murmured Calpurnia, and she spat meditatively into the yard. We looked at her in surprise, for Calpurnia rarely commented on the ways of white people. The neighborhood thought when Mr. Radley went under Boo would come out, but it had another thing coming. Boo's elder brother returned from Pensacola and took Mr. Radley's place. The only difference between him and his father was their ages. 
Jim said Mr. Nathan Radley bought cotton, too. Mr. Nathan would speak to us, however, when we said good morning, and sometimes we saw him coming from town with a magazine in his hand. The more we told Dill about the Radleys, the more he wanted to know. The longer he would stand hugging the light pole on the corner, the more he would wonder. Wonder what he does in there, he would murmur. Looks like he'd just stick his head out the door. Jem said, he goes out all right when it's pitch dark. Miss Stephanie Crawford said she woke up in the middle of the night one time and saw him looking straight through the windows at her. Said his head was like a skull looking at her. Ain't you ever waked up at night and heard him, Dill? He walks like this. Jem slid his feet through the gravel. Why do you think Miss Rachel locks up so tight at night? I've seen his tracks in our backyard many a morning, and one night I heard him scratching on the back screen, but he was gone time Atticus got there. Wonder what he looks like, said Dill. Jem gave a reasonable description of Boo. Boo was about six and a half feet tall, judging from his tracks. He dined on raw squirrels and any cats he could catch. That's why his hands were blood-stained. If you ate an animal raw, you could never wash the blood off. There was a long, jagged scar that ran across his face. What teeth he had were yellow and rotten. His eyes popped, and he drooled most of the time. Let's try to make him come out, said Dill. I'd like to see what he looks like. Jem said if Dill wanted to get himself killed, all he had to do was go up and knock on the front door. Our first raid came to pass only because Dill bet Jem, the Grey Ghost, against two Tom Swifts that Jem wouldn't get any farther than the Radley Gate. In all his life, Jem had never declined to dare. Jem thought about it for three days. I suppose he loved honor more than his head, for Dill wore him down easily. You're scared, Dill said the first day. Ain't scared, just respectful, Jem said. The next day, Dill said, You're too scared even to put your big toe in the front yard. Jem said he reckoned he wasn't. He'd passed the Radley place every school day of his life. Always running, I said. But Dill got him the third day, when he told Jem that folks in Meridian certainly weren't as afraid as the folks in Maycomb that he'd never seen such scary folks as the ones in Maycomb. This was enough to make Jem march to the corner, where he stopped and leaned against the light pole, watching the gate hanging crazily on its homemade hinge. I hope you've got it through your head that he'll kill each us, every one, Dill Harris, said Jem when he joined him. Don't blame me when he gouges your eyes out. You started it, remember? You're still scared, murmured Dill patiently. Jim wanted Dill to know once and for all that he wasn't scared of anything. It's just that I can't think of a way to make him come out without him getting us. Besides, Jim had his little sister to think of. When he said that, I knew he was afraid. Jim had his little sister to think of the time I dared him to jump off the top of the house. If I got killed, what's become of you? he asked. Then he jumped, landed unhurt, and in his sense of responsibility left him until confronted by the Radley place. "'You're going to run out on a dare?' asked Dill. "'If you are, then—' "'Dill, you have to think about these things,' Jem said. "'Let me think a minute. It's sort of like making a turtle come out.' "'How's that?' asked Dill. "'Strike a match under him?' I told Jim if he set fire to the Radley house, I was going to tell Atticus on him. Dill said striking a match under a turtle was hateful. Ain't hurtful, just persuades him. It's not like you'd chunk him in the fire, Jim growled. How do you know a match don't hurt him? Turtles can't feel stupid, said Jim. Were you ever a turtle, huh? My stars, Dill. Now let me think. I reckon we could rock him. Jim stood and thought so long that Dill made a mild concession. I won't say you ran out on the dare, and I'll swap you the gray ghost if you just go up and touch the house. 
Jem brightened. Touch the house, that's all? Dill nodded. Sure, that's all now. I don't want you hollering something different the minute I get back. Yeah, that's all, said Dill. He'll probably come out after you when he sees you in the yard. Then Scout and me will jump on him and hold him down till we can tell him we ain't going to hurt him. We left the corner, crossed the side street that ran in front of the Radley house, and stopped at the gate. Well, go on, said Dill. Scout and me's right behind you. I'm going, said Jem. Don't hurry me. He walked to the corner of the lot, then back again, studying the simple trade as if deciding how best to effect an entry, frowning and scratching his head. Then I sneered at him. Jim threw open the gate and sped to the side of the house, slapped it with his palm, and ran back to us, not wanting to see if his foray was successful. Dill and I followed on his heels. Safely on our porch, panting and out of breath, we looked back. The old house was the same, droopy and sick. But as we stared down the street, we thought we saw an inside shutter move. Flick. A tiny, almost invisible movement. And the house was still. End of chapter one.